Fantastic. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Scottish Summit 2021 and welcome to our great speakers for this session, Lucas and Andreas, uh, who will be speaking to us about D365 field service. Let's talk ERP integrations. So, without any further ado, over to you guys. Take it away. Thank you, Peter. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. We always uh, wish that we could be uh, on site and being with you guys in person. Unfortunately, with this whole COVID thing, we, we can't be, but looking forward to next year and being part of, of the Scottish Sessions uh, or Scottish Summit uh, going forward in the future. So uh, welcome to our session. Uh, this is going to be uh, a, a really informative session in, with regards to ERP, implement, ERP implementations and integrations here. Uh, this is something that we breathe and eat and sleep uh, pretty much every day here with ongoing projects. And we're working with Microsoft a lot and partners and customers alike to make sure that we find the best solutions here going forward. As you guys know, uh, field service for those of you guys who may not be familiar uh, requires some integrations, uh, especially within D365 uh, for us to be able to do invoicing or bring in things like assets and agreements. But we'll talk about that shortly here and making sure that it works uh, end to end. So look forward to these presentations. But before that, we get started here. I want to make sure that we give a good shout out to our sponsors who really make this uh, happen, especially Script Runner, DQ Global, Proximo, Redspire, Agilisys, uh, and Hitachi Solutions, a good old friends of ours. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as well, one of the things is uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, towards the end, we're going to leave a little bit of time to make sure that you guys uh, put some questions in the chat so that we can uh, answer them. And obviously, this is a very deep and broad topic. Uh, so if you have anything that you want to uh, discuss or anything, we're always open to, to discuss. Put it in the chat. We'll also share our information towards the end of the session. My name is Lucas Diaz, and I'm a managing partner here at Ludia Consulting. And I've been doing uh, ERP implementations, uh, Microsoft Dynamics for close to 15 years here from all levels, from the technical side to the functional integrations, a PM, project management, whatever, uh, janitor, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, so so all this experience that I'm going to highlight here today is it, really a result of all those years and being able to do field service and ERP implementations. Uh, with me, I'm also going to have uh, Andreas Vogel. So Andreas, you want to say hi? I will. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andreas Vogel. I'm the other managing partner at Ludia Consulting. And like Lucas, I've been doing exclusively Microsoft Dynamics AX and D365 FNO for the last over 15 years and been in the IT space for over 20 years. Glad to be here and looking forward to talking about integrations. Yes, thanks, Andreas. And together with Andreas, we've been in an in a awesome journey here working together with the Microsoft product team uh, in figuring the future of, of ERP integrations, especially within field service. So thank you, Andreas. We'll, we'll, we're going to get into it here shortly, but let's go ahead. Let's talk integrations. So field service uh, integrations, as I was talking earlier, or ERP integrations for field service completes really the whole picture. What do I mean by that? It is from inventory to agreements to invoicing. It's bringing it all together for field service. We know that within D365 field service, right now, sure, you can track customers, you can track agreements and things like that. But what about the other part of it? What about the costing of agreements? What about the inventory management, uh, mins and maxes, all those things, warehouses, where are they created? RMAs, what happens to them? All those things are really great within D365 field service, but I feel that we need the whole picture when it integrates over into ERP for it to be really an end-to-end -end solution. So we've been spending close to, I would say, almost 10 years in this space one way or another and integrating with, with FNO or what it used to be 2012 or in 2009 and how these two systems play together to bring the enterprise solution that a lot of customers need. So uh, as you can see, we're going to give a little bit of a different flavor here. Uh, I think we had a presentation a long time ago about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we decided to, to bring it back because it really gives us a good flavor. 
uh, of of what it is really uh, this integration. Uh, so when it started for you guys who don't know this movie with Clint Eastwood and is as personally one of my favorites an old school American style uh, Clint Eastwood movie. But in here, uh, he has, he goes, the movie is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and this is really how it is. It's a showdown, right? To make sure that we have a good enterprise solution uh, for our customers. So why don't we go ahead and get started here and talk a little bit about the good. The good. So if you go, uh, if you have D365 field service, right? And you have, uh, you want to get the integrations up and running. There's two solutions, right? That you can get uh, hooked up right out of the box. Um, the P&I and P2C, right? That uh, P2, P&I is the project and inventory and the P2C is the prospect to cash solutions. So notice that this actually sets up our integrator uh, project. In what it is, it allows us to kind of get things moving. So I'm going to move from on the left hand side on the right hand side. I'm going to kind of talk about each one of these because some of it, depending on your project, depending on your client or customer, may change. Uh, the interesting part is that this is also a good debate within Microsoft as to what's the best way to do it going forward. So I'm going to share a little bit uh, of that with you guys. So on the left hand side, we know that warehouses, for example, originate on the ERP, and that makes sense, right? Because um, warehouses are going to be tracked, managed, main maxes, uh, inventory uh, settings, things like that. Same things with on-hand inventory, but inventory transfers, right, may also happen within FNO, right? So there could be a warehouse manager um, that is doing all the transactions on behalf of the field service team or the coordinator and such. So notice that some of those items so some of those uh, data integrator projects already kind of work out of the box but some of them may actually need to go the other way in some scenarios right as we start getting more into the finance side of things uh, notice that we have projects and we have sales orders so this is a super super contentious part of, of the integration within field service because it depends on whether you're going to use sales orders or uh, financial projects right or uh, the way that you have either, um, for example, what we call here in the US a Comcast scenario, whether you're going to go and visit a bunch of sites and there are a bunch of customers and then you don't have to worry about anything but sending an invoice. On the other side on a project is when you actually need to track cost, profitability and things like that. So you actually may have a, a little bit more uh, development of this area because you need to tie a project for you guys familiar with uh, FNO or FNSC, is that you have to tie the project with the agreement as well for you to be able to, to really track profitability and know what's actually covered uh, under an agreement. So this um, actually sometimes uh, we, we make sure that we have it in the external projects table and we do some enhancements to it. But overall, the integration allows us to get that data over uh, into CE or field service. And then we have the work orders flowing. Now, this is interesting, right? Because especially as, as we talked about, is how do you get into the sales order or uh, journal lines, for example, versus the, the service management or um, even the EAM, right? So these are areas that you may want to switch within the standard DI integrator, depending on how your implementation is. Products um, go in here as well. They come over. And these are release products so that you can use. There's inventory, non-inventory products that you can use. So for example, for field service, we use, um, for example, some, some labors may, not, may be non-inventory or some uh, knickknacks or some, some generic kind of items or products will also be part of that. So um, these are actually integrated. We had to make some modifications to, to make sure that um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about later in the parts request area. But yeah, out of the box, you can see I can already pinpoint that you may have, depending on your implementation, some direction, some change in the direction of the flow or also uh, information that you're going to need. Now, let's talk a little bit about P2C, right? So notice that um, the way that it's wired is for having, or, or the way that the concept started was having the, the customer and the account being created within uh, CRM. 
So the interesting part is that if you have an ERP in the background, maybe your CRM may not be the good uh, place to start for a customer. Maybe it's all the way around because really you got to define who is the system of record or which is the system of record to hold this uh, account records or customers. Same with contacts, right? There may be a much more activity uh, in the ERP side, but either way, we sometimes want to switch this uh, flow around. I think we talked a little bit about products. And now when we talk about quote, order, and invoice, right? <clears throat> it really depends on where you're driving your invoices from and depends or, or how your business flows as a whole. In this case, we actually, uh, in a lot of cases that we've had ERP involved, is that we generate the invoices out of ERP. So we got to make sure that all the supporting data associated with what did I use, what labor did I have, what project is associated with it, and what agreement is tied to it as well. We got to make sure that all that supporting data has been integrated properly for us to get to the invoice step. So nevertheless, my prerequisites here uh, or um, provides you a way to integrate with some prerequisites, obviously, with regards to field service and what you need to have. So let's go to the next stage here. Let's talk about the bad. <laughs> this uh, slide always cracks me up. So let's talk about the bad, right? So there's a lot of things that are missing here that are not necessarily kind of out of the box, right? So as an implementer, we come across this quite a bit in which we must decide what else are we missing to really even complete the picture even outside of uh, CE field service or uh, ERP. So what is missing? So for a working field service implementation, there's a lot of things that we need to also have that we need to integrate in. Number one is workers. So workers or uh, um, subcontractors, for example, are they going to be bookable resources for you guys familiar with in field service? Is okay, they're bookable resources, and then do we need skills or characteristics, right? Coming over from ERP, are they going to do being uh, being do doing work on the field, or also uh, are they subcontractors? Are they going to be sending invoices? So what happens to those invoices, and how do you track the cost associated with these workers? Right. So those are things that you must really understand in order for us for, for you to have a, a good picture of a resource management within field service. The next one that is missing is the agreements and agreements lines. Right. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the concept of an agreement, for example, it is um, I went to a store here, let's say in the US, you go to Best Buy and you buy something and I buy a 60 inch TV, for example. And then they sell you an agreement and says a coverage for three years. That agreement is going to cost you a certain amount of time. And they're going to say, um, I don't know if, if you would have this, but you, they come and check on your TV every two weeks or every quarter or every year or whatever. And so, but next day I went and bought another TV or a VCR or, or DVD or computer, whatever it is, right? So I need to know what is covered and what is not covered under my agreements. So this is something that the ERP does really well um, and be able to track uh, what is covered under those agreements, what the cost of it is, what also the ongoing cost as the, this agreement goes through the, life, uh, through the lifespan here, right? So what about renewals? What about the intervals? So for example, how often do I need to go and visit the site? So I need to tell field service somehow that this was sold and this needs to be taken into action. Right, and I want to cost it and understand it from a true perspective for for my company. So agreements become a crucial part of the integration picture here as well. The next part here is uh, service objects or EAM or enterprise asset management and customer assets. So what is the system of record that is going to be uh, originating these assets? There could be uh, internal assets that get serviced, right? So uh, let's say a company has a bunch of gas pumps and things like that or high, a big machinery, those need to become customer assets on the field because uh, we would be our own customer in that case. But what about the categories? Uh, are we covering those assets? Are we not covering those assets under an agreement? So do we really need to rethink that from an integration perspective? The next one is uh, one of them that is near and dear to my heart. It's called parts request. So what happens when I need a part out on the field? 
right? And I need somebody to create a PO, source it and deliver it, right? To my, either my customer or my, my technician. So these are things that I need to understand with regards to uh, field service and ERP. What happens when that part comes back? What if it's bad, right? There's an RTB or an RMA for you guys who are not familiar is a returns material authorization or return to vendor. So I have a part that I needs to go out or it needs to come in for quality uh, or it needs to be put into quarantine and things like that. So those are things when we deal with field service and ERP, those are some areas that we really need to, to create every time they'll come into an implementation. So now let's move on to the ugly. So Andreas, giving it over to you. <laughs> this is the favorite part. Let's talk about the data integrator. Absolutely. So the data integrator is something that we have a good amount of experience with. And um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Lucas. We'll touch on a couple of shortcomings, essentially, of the data integrator. These are, these are items that are good to be aware of when you are going through or, or choosing an integration platform. Most, most of these topics are going to be on the technical level. So I just want to make sure that we're, Lucas did a nice job talking about the functional shortcomings and some of the opportunities. On the data integrator side, we'll talk about some of the, 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 the data integrator really is the out of the box Microsoft provided integration mechanism between Microsoft Dynamics CE and FNO. So we'll launch into these items here. So as most or some of you know, there is not really a true comparison between an FNO or a finance and supply chain legal entity and a CE organization, business unit or company. And as the data integrator currently stands, this is something that you would have to customize to ensure that transactions or data is flowing from the proper legal entity in FNSC to the right place in CE and vice versa. So that is something we have in our experience only known to work in a customization. The data integrator will actually show you a mapping and allow you to make a mapping between legal entities and organizations. However, the data doesn't travel properly between the two systems. Something else to consider is, is that as you create additional integrations uh, from other than the out of the box tables now, uh, so we have the word entity in here, Microsoft has changed this to now be the entity, I'm sorry, the entity is now a table and fields. The table ownership matters so table ownership can be organization or user or team in ce or the dataverse and you will not have the ability to map the organization from the data integrator period so if you're planning on having any kind of logic drive off of the out of the box mapping that the data integrator provides you it is not available for a table such as uh, products Okay, the data integrator is inherently a schedule-based architecture. Okay, so this is important to understand. So if you are in the need for real-time integration, you can instantly eliminate the data integrator. Based on Microsoft's feedback and in our experience as well, it is not recommended that any specific schedule in the data integrator runs faster than five or 10 minutes. It really depends on the specific table we're talking about, but it is not recommended to run any faster than five or 10 minutes, even though you do have the ability to schedule it on a minute basis. Error handling. The data integrator does provide a way for you to get emails if there are issues, and it also does re-trigger in integration flow if there are errors. However, if there is a warning, the data integrator project will not re-trigger itself. So this is something important to understand because it isn't quite clear initially, at least for some folks who are not familiar with this platform, that errors do re-trigger and warnings do not. So it's, it's really important to understand that 
it seems somewhat some counterintuitive that if you have a warning, you need to go in and manually re-trigger the integration. But if you get an email with an error, you can expect one additional rerun from the platform itself. The first bullet point there is that the error messages are not, at least in the email notification, do not provide you with enough detail to truly be able to troubleshoot what is going on. What we have found is that the best place to really understand what the error is, it is in finance and supply chain or FNO. The data management module is the place where this air where the air mechanisms or really the dmf aspect is where you can find any kind of error logging asynchronous versus synchronous so data pulls from the ce perspective are synchronous and we have a timeout of 300 seconds so i want to make sure everybody understands this and in other words if i am running a ce if I'm getting data from FNO or from supply chain management into CE, into field service, and that data pool takes more than 300 seconds, you will get a timeout. So one thing that we've had to do is also reduce the size, and by size, I mean the number of fields in an entity in FNSC to make sure that we are not running into timeout scenarios. Most of the projects should be set up as, or, or by default are actually set up as change-based projects. You just need to make sure that you have change tracking enabled on the entity in FNO. But if you are sending more than 300 seconds worth of data, or five minutes, if your project takes more than five minutes to run, when the data comes out of FNO, you will get a timeout something to be mindful of and this really eliminates the data integrator being a good candidate for example a, a cutover or data load um, activity but you're not going to want to use the data integrator for that because you will likely have a timeout doing an initial go live of a project or a very 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 large load from fno or um, fnsc to c um, asynchronous or synchronous, so data pushes are asynchronous. So when we send data from CE into FNO, that is an asynchronous operation, and we have a longer time out there. Okay, the next topic is application lifecycle, or really um, data integrator project lifecycle. There are no good ways to be able to migrate a project from one tenant to another. Within a tenant, you have the ability to save an existing data integrator project as a template, but there is no way to promote that template and, and truly structure as you would with a normal piece of development, the, the migration of the project. Advanced query. This one's an interesting one. Advanced Query is fantastic in its own right. It provides the tool set that is provided here, uh, allows you to do some very complicated and intricate transforms, as well as adding uh, default fields and so on. However, one thing to be mindful of, and this is one of the things that has uh, even we have, we've discovered this and have lived through the pain, the Advanced Query tool does allow you to actually create unsupported configurations. And specifically, an example I can call out here is that if you were to join two OData data sources in the advanced query, the tool will let you do it. Everything will look like it works just perfectly fine. However, when data is actually being sent, what we found is that there is intermittent data that is missing and we have zero trace of why it's missing and in talking with microsoft that there's actually are some unsupported advanced query configurations and that is one of them so the message here is just because the tool or the advanced query tool allows you to do certain things doesn't mean that it is supported so 
make sure to educate yourself. If you are still using or are using the data integrator, make sure you're fully aware of what all the different advanced query options and supported versus unsupported um, pieces of development are. All right, Lucas, back to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Andreas. And this is interesting. So being more specific about uh, about advanced query from a from a functional perspective is that what we try to do is do a work order within uh, CE and we wanted to bring all the notes or activities uh, over into FNO for invoicing, right? So uh, whoever was running the invoices wanted to know what was being said or what was going to be appearing on the invoice. So that's a left join, right? Uh, with regards to the data that needed to come across and we found out that for example some of the notes were not coming over sporadically and we couldn't find out why and so this is where the advanced query allows us to do a little bit more than um i mean it's unsupported so it allows you to do a little bit more than you expect and you expect it to work and it does work sometimes so uh you just got to be very detail oriented and make sure that you, there's a lot of testing going on behind the scenes as you put the integrator or the data integrator in place. So let's go forward and let's talk a little bit about the future. All right. So um, Andres, do you want to speak to that? Do you want me to, to speak to this one? So I can take this. So the future, um, the future, if you are looking to use what Microsoft provides out of the box, which is something that is, we highly do recommend you absolutely investigate, is what is called dual right. We have a few disclaimers about this. So dual right and the data integrator cannot run side by side. So this is important to understand. It is an unsupported way by Microsoft to run the integrations. There's a slight small asterisk there. They can in technically run side by side, but it is, is not a supported configuration. And there is a high chance that you will experience some deadlocking if you do choose to run them side by side, if you're not extra careful about exactly which entities or tables are being synchronized between the systems. So first and foremost, if you are planning on running dual rights and the data integrator side by side, make 100% sure to review all the dependencies, the exact tables and entities that you are planning on integrating or have already integrated and establish a transition plan. The next thing, and this will go for any integration, is you always should know to identify where the system of record is. Now, something to be aware of with dual write uh, that the data integrator does not have, dual write actually integrates bidirectionally. So you can have a change in CE that instantly flows into FNO, and then you can go right back and change that same record in FNO, and that change will go back to CE. For the data integrator, because you're on a schedule, that paradigm doesn't really work, um, at least not in, in a real world scenario. It, it technically could work, but you would run into many different uh, dependency issues with the data integrator where the dual write approach would resolve that. So it is a different way of thinking about which system is the, the, the true source of the, or the ownership system of a piece of data. And that is, in, 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 as you approach any integration, it is important to have that established up front so that you can not only properly architect the system, but you can also, it's important to really set expectations with the users to make sure that they are aware, okay, if I make the change here, it's only gonna go one way or it's or, or I can make changes in both uh, systems and it should sync itself up, but again, Setting expectations with users is a big aspect of what we do. Okay, next one. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Andres. This is so funny because this is where a technical and functional kind of overlap. So just to, to add here it is that please make sure that before you start kind of integrating, right, you have a plan, right? You establish communication for how changes are going to be tracked, right? So you utilize in DevOps, for example, 
also understand how your legal entity structure is going to work, how everything is going to be uh, brought over from literally one side to the other and what needs to talk back. So for example, we had a, a, an interesting scenario in which we make a, a parts request, right? So I order something from Amazon and Amazon needs to tell me that my order has been ordered or received, ordered, delivered, for example, and I have a PO or an order number associated with it. So I needed to go from CE to FNO or FNSC back to CE and maybe even potentially even back again, right? If I want to add additional notes, like I'm not going to be there today, so please deliver to this address. So keep that in mind with regards to integrations. Make sure that on your acceptance criteria, if you use sprints or whatnot, uh, that it, it is extremely clarified of how this is going to work and make sure that when you're introducing, for example, dual right to an implementation, that uh, you kind of understand uh, where you're at, right? When can you introduce it? How do you introduce it? Because they don't play nice uh, with each other as of today, right? So those P2C solutions that we were talking about earlier, uh, we keep that in mind, right? Because this is going to, to play with your implementation timeline. So manage that, manage that up front and be upfront with your client, right? And be able to say that uh, right now we're gonna have to use DI and, uh, you know, dual right is coming and potentially dual right is just going to take over right and it's just going to be the way of the future so please uh, ensure that you're also up to the latest with the microsoft product team there uh there's a couple of uh yammer sites uh, as well that you can enter and if needed uh just ping us and we'll, we'll share that information with you guys but this is uh, really the future and take an architect's hat uh when you're thinking of this as, as you move forward all right Back to you. All right, so dual right, what does it look like? So there was a few other bullet points that I didn't talk through on the last slide. One of them is uh, make sure to get yourself familiar with, and, and you can see your finance and operations, that is still what it is called when, when you finance and supply chain, when you actually open the app, it says finance and operations. So here we have two screenshots of dual right. Dual right is configured and administrated as well as managed in finance and operations or finance and supply chain. Something first and foremost to understand. It is part of the data management module. And on the left side of the screen, what you see, this is a little um, blurry here, You, um, but I'll, I'll talk through it very quickly. Hopefully everybody can follow. This is a basic table mapping, an out of the box table mapping for the customer's version three entity and finance and operations to the common data service account. So in other words, finance and operations is on the left side and these are all the fields on the left column. And in the middle, you'll see a map type which is an equal or a greater than. If you if we were to be able to scroll down, you see some less than signs. And then on the right part of that column, you'll see, again, the common data service accounts, a little small here. Essentially what we're saying is the field from finance and operations equals this field in the common data service. Now, when you have a greater than sign, that means that the synchronization direction for dual right is that it only flows from the left side into the right side. In other words, in this case, from finance and operations into CE. So the source of our data for a specific field can be designated in dual right. That is not something you were able to do in the data integrator. So the data integrator was at a complete project or entity level, whereas in a dual right, you can specifically call out the exact fields on which and which way they should be traveling. So an equal sign means bidirectional integration. So if I make a change on the very first one here, um, it was probably a bad one. So let's use the invoice address city. It's a little, again, a little small, it's the second field down. So if I make a change on the invoice address city in FNO, it will update the address to city in the accounts in CE. Once that change has been made, if I wait a little bit and uh, say, oh, that wasn't right, I can go actually into CE, change address to city and CE, and that change will flow back into FNO. With a greater than sign, if we go roughly four records down there, 
Again, that means only changes from FNO make their way over to CE. You can also have the arrow going the other way so that only changes from CE make their way over into FNO. So this is a, just a quick preview of what dual write looks like and what it can do at a quick configuration level. The right part of the screenshot, or let's take a look at the right screenshot here. What we're showing is a transformation. So dual write does not have the ability for more advanced transforms like the advanced query from the data integrator does. And the really the reason is, is that because of how quickly the records need to synchronize, it doesn't lend itself, dual write really doesn't lend itself to do any more complex transformation other than some very basic, if the value is no, make it false. If the value is yes, make it true, or one is a true, or, or one is a false, and zero is a true. So the, these kind of things you can still do with dual write However, with the data integrator, you have much more flexibility. So again, as if you are transitioning from data integrator to dual write, these are some things to really be mindful of. And the, the mandate or the um, approach that is recommended is that if you are needing to do transforms, you may just want to think about doing those in the source system before anything is sent, period, and not make the actual integration layer do any of the heavy lifting. Right? So again, here's just some quick screenshots of how dual write works. We actually have an instance of dual write up and running here. If we do have some time or we have some questions that people are interested in, we'll be more than happy to show that during the Q&A section today. Awesome. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. And uh, keep that in mind, right? As new implementations uh, come through uh, for you guys, or you're, you're thinking about starting a new project at, that deals with integration, make sure that you start taking a look at it, get added to the Yammer team, participate uh, in the Yammer group, and also make sure that you talk to Microsoft or collaborate with us, ping us at any time, right? We're here to support and make sure that we have a good, healthy ecosystem. Uh, here since we support partners and, and clients alike. So let's go into additional information. So <laughs> this one is um, basically, uh, we're gonna send the, the uh, slides as well, but these are uh, some, some information for you guys uh, go further with this integration topic, right? How does P2C work in dual, right? How does uh, everything happen, right, within uh, managing CDS? How do you do that? The entities, the company concept, all those things, those are items that have really, uh, we spent months and months uh, navigating this, this topics. And we have some uh, interesting solutions, also some advice and some feedback from Microsoft team. So Rama and uh, all the team there has been super kind to us and allowed us in to, to kind of help this make better for everyone. So also at the bottom of it, I'm also putting there a link for you guys to see the good, the bad and the ugly, the official trailer back in the day, the good old school movies. And I'm gonna open it up for questions here now. Um, since we have only a few minutes, how are we doing on time, Peter? Hey Lucas, we're doing uh, pretty good on time actually, so thank, thank you so much. We do have one question in the chat actually, which um, we've got two in fact now. So the first question we have for you is from Dean, and he is asking, do you know of any reference implementation clients who have used dual write? It, thanks, Dean. Uh, that's a good question. So the question was, any referenceable customers using dual write? So I do know that there are some implementations out there that are in the, I would say, the pilot to go live stages. Uh, I know that there are some that are having some significant issues there and working with the product team. So we're uh, cautiously optimistic of everything that is happening currently. So to, to answer your question, um, sort of, right? So Microsoft uh, will probably have some, some case studies as, as things stabilize with dual write a little bit more, uh, but it's definitely a work in progress to perfection from the Microsoft side. So uh, with clients, we get that request a lot 
and we normally kind of defer them to Microsoft to provide additional details since they got a telemetry and also the insights into the whole uh, implementation. Amazing. And we have another question from Thomas, uh, who's asking, can you add the Yammer group here for dual right? Yes, uh, I'll provide that link. I'll add it to the presentation uh, as well. I think you have to uh, request an invite. I'll, I'll add some details here as part of the previous section uh, as well, right, where we have all our links. Uh, but yeah, it, it is something that you guys can get added to and see all the, the issues or good things or updates from Microsoft that are happening uh, in real time, right? You get to talk directly to, to Rama and some of the, the PMs that are working in that area. Amazing, fantastic. Well, I've really enjoyed this session, uh, Lucas and Andres. It's been really interesting stuff uh, from the point of view of somebody who is, uh, uh, this is out of my uh, comfort zone for sure, being a Microsoft 365 security and compliance guy. But uh, so nice change for me, without a doubt. But um, what we'll do, we'll just give a, a couple more minutes for anyone in the chat who, who wants to ask uh, a couple more questions. But um, while we're waiting, is there any, anything else, uh, Lucas and Andres, you want to, to round off with or add? Sure, we always got more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, a, you know, the first question was actually a, a good one, and we get that a lot. And it is, it, it's a tough one because dual, dual right is, is new technology per se. So uh, it, it's being tested out and tried, and um, it's really becoming enterprise grade or trying to become. So just make sure you test and you test the, Test it extensively and make sure that it works reliably and also perform uh, do a performance testing. So load a bunch of records into your source system and make sure that you're getting the expected results uh, as needed, right? As, as you expect them to come across or be updated in the, the destination system. And be upfront, be, be completely open, right? Because uh, if Microsoft is still changing things, just report that to the, your client, right? And let them know the, the risk, but the benefits as well of being in the, this new technology and being on the bleeding edge. Amazing, fantastic. Uh, we do have one more comment a stroke question from Thomas here, who was saying, uh, we've been testing it in a customer case. However, mainly work is done on the F and O side. What has been the main issues within customer projects so far in your experience? It, I wish uh, I wish we could get the, the Thomas live here. Um, within projects, it's uh, there's a lot of work on the uh, FNO side that needs to be set up to get projects working correctly, right? So when you create a customer, you have to create the projects kind of in advance if you want to also link it to agreements, and that puts a lot of um, lift on the FNO side, right? Also, you got to make sure your pricing is set up correctly. Make sure all your um, uh, financial dimensions are set up as well. So there's quite a bit on the financial side that has to be uplifted for us to be able to use projects correctly through the integration. Fantastic. Did I, yeah. And did I answer your question, Thomas? Um, if you could say in the chat, Thomas, if uh, if that has uh, answered your query, that would be great. I shall keep an eye on that. But uh, otherwise, well, I can uh, I can chime in on a different aspect of that question. Is I think I may have heard the question slightly differently. Um, a challenge that we've been running into with dual right, at least an hour, um, in, in our experience, is that uh, we have been working from uh, converting from the data integrator to dual right, and one of the real challenges there is that you do need to uninstall the prospect to cache solutions and a number of other solutions in CE for a supported dual write environment, and that implies a production outage because what you will need to do is unload data out of CE, remove the solutions, and then load the data back into CE. So that is one thing for everybody to really be mindful of if you are transitioning from the DI into dual write, so the data integrated to dual write, just be mindful that that needs to be factored into your project plan or into your conversion 
strategy and plan and approach. Fantastic. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Andreas. Thomas has just uh, re replied, actually, just saying that, um, oh, that's perfect. Thanks, in fact. You, you have addressed, <laughs> you have addressed the, his query. Uh, amazing stuff. So uh, we don't have any more questions, and I think we're just about at the right time, which is perfect. So I'd really like to thank you both, Lucas and uh, Andreas, especially joining us uh, early in your day from uh, Portland, Oregon, and Denver, Colorado, respectively. So really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for joining us on this uh, fantastic session today. Please do leave feedback for the guys. Uh, it, it means a lot to, to them and to uh, the organizers of Scottish Summit 2021. And we appreciate you all very, very much. So without further ado, we shall uh, say goodbye for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter, for being our, our uh um leader here so and thank you guys for your time really appreciate it it's been an honor to be with you guys today please contact us on linkedin uh we're we're all over the place on our website just just uh touch base with us we're here to help good luck with your integrations thanks everyone thanks everybody thanks for having us thanks all goodbye